This was just moments ago. Former Georgia governor, former president Jimmy Carter to throw out the first ball and look at this pitch. You know, if the ump wants to give him the high strike, that's right in there and with some hop on it. 43, we're told, on the radar gun. Not bad. You know, usually, look at this. Afterwards, still spry, hops over the railing. And he's going to get a hug here from Jane Fonda. So already it's been a good night for Jimmy Carter. A lot of people who throw out that first ball, they just lollipop it up there. That had some zing on it. Joe Morgan, Bob Euchre, Bob Costas up in the booth. A lot is made about a team doing better the second time around against a pitcher. Certainly the Indians adjusted to Greg Maddox, beat him in game five. But hitters aren't the only ones who can adjust. Well, you always expect a good hitting team to do better the second time around against a good pitcher. But so much has been made about the Indians moving closer to the plate and taking the outside corner away from Greg Maddox. Since they had some success doing that, you can expect them to do the same tonight against Tom Glavin. But Glavin will combat this by coming inside a little more often and keeping them honest. But the one thing he can't do is get away from his strength, and that is throwing the change up away and the fastball away. So he's going to have to come inside, but he has to keep his strength going. Glavin beat Martinez in game two despite the fact that Glavin was not terribly sharp by his standards worked just six innings but was the pitcher of record and got the win. Martinez was much better the time before last when he had almost a week's rest and nailed down the LCS to Seattle. Now tonight he has five full days rest. Well as you said Bob in his first outing he was working on four days. The problem with that with Martinez is that he starts throwing upstairs and when he throws upstairs he's meat and in that opening game when Lopez hit the homer against him a two runner to win it for the Braves that really finished Martinez as you said he's working on five days rest should be stronger excellent sinker good breaking ball good change and he's not afraid to pitch inside and by inside I mean really backing you off you guys ready for this absolutely let's go baby the World Series let's go with tonight's Budweiser Cleveland Indians starting lineup Lofton and center this gallant short by at second playing with the tender ankle but he's done pretty well despite it Albert Bell coming alive in Cleveland in the cleanup spot Eddie Murray who had a game two homer off Glavin has to play the field without the DH in the National League Park Manny Ramirez is in right Jim Tomey at third base Pena will catch Martinez again so once again they will form the oldest battery in World Series history. Pena is 38, and Martinez takes the mound at age 40. Tom Glavin was 16 and 7 for the season. 1 and 0 in the postseason, as you see, he pitched well in both the division series and the LCS, but had no decisions against both the Rockies and the Reds. Then he won game two of this World Series, which makes his overall World Series record three and two. The defense behind him now. Klesko back in left field. Polonia had played out there when the DH rule was in effect. Grissom in center. Justice roundly booed by the home fans during introductions. Jones, Belliard, Lemke, and McGriff on the infield. Lopez back behind the plate. O'Brien had caught Maddox in game five. Hey guys. Loft into the plate. Hitting just 238 in this World Series, but it's misleading. Six of his last eight trips, he's really smoked the ball, and his line drives have been caught. He's stolen five bases, two behind the World Series record held by Lou Brock. Down and in for ball one. The plate ump is Joe Brinkman, as deliberate an umpire as you'll find anywhere in the major leagues. There will be hesitation from time to time on balls and strikes. In the air to right center field. Justice is in pursuit of this and calling. And he's got it. So they keep Lofton off the bases. 
Lou Brock stole seven bases in the 67 series for the Cardinals against the Red Sox and the next year against the Tigers. That's the World Series mark. Switch hitter Vizquel. High and away. Hasn't hit much in the postseason, but had a big triple in game three at Cleveland. The Braves leading the series 2 0 at that point had scored a run in the top of the first, and Omar's triple tied it up immediately. One and one. Chipper Jones in on the grass at third. Vizquel is a good bunter. Out in front of the change, one and two. The Indians are trying to do what five teams have done before in a best of seven World Series. Recover from a 3 1 deficit and win. The Pirates against the Senators way back in 1925. And then once in each of the last four decades 58 Yanks against the Milwaukee Braves, 68 Tigers against the Cardinals. One and two again. Check the swing. They check it first. No. And the count levels. At two and two. In 1979, as we look at it from overhead, oh man. A little check swing on a breaking ball that time, but the first base umpire, Harry Wendelston, says nothing doing. Checked in time. Here's the two two. Struck him out. So that'll bring up Bayerga to complete the list. The 79 Pirates were down 3-1 to the Orioles and came back and won. And most recently, 1985, the Kansas City Royals against the Cardinals. Outside ball one to Bayerga. And even though the Indians have moved up on the plate, you st still see Glavin pitching away. And he's going to have to stay away and occasionally come inside. Down and in, 2 0. Game time temperature, 56 degrees, a swirling wind at 15 miles an hour at this point. You know, it's evident here in the opening inning, guys, that this crowd. In Fulton County Stadium is much more into this game than they were in the previous two games played here. Well, Cleveland was one of the few cities that seemed to be immune from the malaise that engulfed baseball elsewhere this year. Beautiful new ballpark, a contending team for the first time in ages. But in Atlanta, like a lot of other places, the interest and eventually the passion came back only over time. Foul back, two and two. Compared to the crowds in Cleveland for games three, four, and five, it was quiet here in Atlanta for the opening two games. You can see the difference immediately in the top of the first here in game six. Bounce back to Glavin. He's out of the first one, two, three. Braves coming up when we come back. And now to tonight's Budweiser Braves starting lineup. At the top, it's Marquise Grissom, who's hitting 381 for the series. Lemke at second will bat second. Chipper Jones at third base. McGriff, the cleanup man. 
Justice in right, hardly the darling of the crowd at this point. Klesko in left, Javier Lopez will catch, Rafael Belliard at short, and Glavin the pitcher. Exactly the same lineup they used against this man, Dennis Martinez, in game two. The one win this postseason was the clincher, also on the road, also in a game six in the American League Championship Series. Then, of course, his team led Seattle 3-2. He was trying to finish it. Now he's trying to prolong it to a game seven in Atlanta. Here's the defense behind him. Bell, Lofton, and Ramirez in the outfield. Tommy plays third. Ordinarily, they might play Espinosa there against a left-handed pitcher. But since left-handed batters do better against Glavin than righties, they stick with Tommy. And you saw the rest of the defense that'll work behind Dennis Martinez. They are ready to celebrate. There is a parade already scheduled for Monday. Beginning on Peachtree Street. Obviously, if the Indians should break their hearts here, the whole city of Cleveland will stage its own parade even before the team gets back. Grissom continues to sizzle. Down and away, ball one. He is hit safely in all 13 postseason games in which the Braves have played. And his 24 postseason hits equals the record. Ordinarily, you'd say, what does that mean? Because there are three rounds of playoffs now, and the comparisons are mostly invalid. But Marty Barrett of the Red Sox, in a seven-game LCS and then a seven-game World Series in 86 for a total of 14 games, had 24 hits. Grissom has his 24 in 13 games. The 1 1 pitch. A line drive caught at first by Eddie Murray. Lemke's hitting 250. And the switch hitter takes strike one. Bob, you were talking earlier about the slow, deliberate calls by the home plate umpire, Joe Brinkman. He does it physically. I mean, verbally, he says strike right away for the catcher, but he gives you that long, slow pull for a strike. Catchers got to know right away. I mean, if it's a strike, guy on, runner going, you want to know immediately. But that's Brinkman's style. And there are a number of others that have a similar style as does Brinkman. On one and one, a curve is outside. Harry Wendelstedt is the umpire at first, Jim McKean at second, Bruce Freming at third, John Hirschbeck left field line, Frank Pulley. Right field line. Two one pitch rolled foul. If there is a seventh game, Harry Wendelstedt would be back behind the plate. Outside of Atlanta and Cleveland, the cities where there is the most interest in this game and the most passion for it might be cities like Granada, Nicaragua, hometown of Dennis Martinez, or the capital city of Managua. It is impossible to overstate what a national hero he is in his home country. The first Nicaraguan to play in the major leagues. Another curveball hit to the hole and through for a base hit. If there is one difference in Dennis Martinez today and five years ago, it's this pitch right here, his curveball. His curveball used to be a lot sharper than it is now. A lot of times it will roll. That one rolled. And with two strikes in the past, he could put you away with that good sharp breaker down and away on the left-handed hitters. Mark Lemke into some great company right there, along with the great Henry Aaron. A ball to Chipper Jones. Henry did it in two World Series, 57 and 58. This is Lemke's third in this decade. You know, Joe, you talked earlier about Indians hitters 
taken Braves pitchers the other way trying to go the other way. It's evident against Martinez here tonight that the Braves are trying to do the same thing. Grissom with that bullet that he hit to Murray and now Lemke with the base hit to left. Well you're right because Martinez has been staying away from right handers and left handers. The 2 0 pitch misses. Bob, I know this is the World Series, but I tell you what, Dennis Martinez comes very close to balking every couple of pitches. He will not stop. And I don't know if they're going to call it tonight, but you watch him closely. Sometimes he'll stop, other times he does not stop. You know, that's what Pena may have went out and told him. Make sure you stop. And you know, Joe, an umpire many times will tell a catcher that. Right. He'll exactly. tell you, you better go out and tell him to stop, or otherwise I'm going to call it on him. That's exactly and right. And that's what Pena may have done. The 3 0 pitch is in there for a strike, and the slow motion call <laughs> by Joe Brinkman. Yeah, as I said before, he says strike immediately, but then has to take time to get his hands out of his pocket. <laughs> Drop his stones in there that he's holding and pump out that right arm. That's all right, Joe. We'll wait for you <laughs> because we have no choice. What did Bobby Cox ask us before the game? Remember when he said, you've seen Brinkman during the year. What kind of an umpire is he? he said, well, he got that little deliberate slow call. Is it, he said, is he one of those guys that gets down on his knee? I said, yeah, he umpires that way. He said, I don't like that. <laughs> Good hit and run situation right here for the Braves, and we'll see if they're going to be aggressive early. He was running. Here comes the throw through on strike two, and they got it. That was a great catch and tag by Vizquel because the throw was off the bag from Pena. It wasn't a real bad throw by Pena, but you're right, Bob. It was off the bag. He had to get rid of it very, very quickly. There it is, a breaking ball strike on the outside corner, slightly on the shortstop side. And I got to tell you, I thought he was in there. I did, too. I thought he was in there before the play was even called. Here's another look at it. Lemke, to me, well, you can't see it from that angle because of McKeon. And now Chipper Jones goes the other way for a two-out single. It is possible that Jim McKean missed that call at second base. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that he was safe, and you'll see that. He hits the bag. Now, here comes the tag way up on the calf, so you can see that he was in there. And Bob and I saw it with our naked eye up here that he was safe. There wasn't much of a complaint from Lemke on the, on the call, Joe, but I really did. I, I thought he was in there. Couple of hits in the inning, but only one man on with two outs, and now McGriff fouls it off. With no margin for error, Mike Hargrove is wasting no time. The right hander, Chad OJ, is up in the first inning, and now Jim Poole, seconds ago, the left hander, joins him. Well, Bob, I noticed when he was warming up in the bullpen, Dennis Martinez was not throwing free and easy, even in the bullpen. I mean, he just seemed like he could never get loose down there. The 0 1 pitch high and away. He is the kind of guy Martinez who will not kid his manager if he doesn't feel 100 percent he will tell him for the good of the team I can't do as well for you as somebody else you might put in there. Well he looks like he's in uh, in in trouble now and, and in discomfort you know for a guy who's had arm and elbow problems Joe I'm surprised he doesn't wear a long sleeve sweatshirt it's going to be a little cold here where your arm stays hot you get a sweat up. One and two now to McGriff. Well, if you watch his delivery, it's just there's it's not a free flowing delivery. He seems like he's his arm is a little stiff. He's not free. Now watch his arm. It looked like he's pushing the ball right there, not snapping it and following through. Trying to get out of the bottom of the first. A throw in behind Chipper Jones, but he skips back. But the one thing about good pitchers you better get them when you have your opportunities. 
if he is able to get loose after the first couple of innings you could see the real Dennis Martinez. So it's going to be up to the Braves to try to make him pay early if he's not throwing well. Still two and two. I mentioned that Martinez was the first Nicaraguan to play in the major leagues. There have been others to follow him, but he remains the top guy in the minds of his countrymen. When he pitched the perfect game for the Expos against the Dodgers in 1991, they declared a national holiday, the Day of the Sportsman, in his honor. And they call him El Presidente only half kiddingly. There are people who think that if he did run for office, he could win in Nicaragua. Called strike three. No runs, two hits, one left after one. No score, game six. <laughs> Albert Bell has only four hits in this World Series, but two of them were homers in Cleveland as he came alive at Jacobs Field. They both went the opposite direction. This one off Steve Avery in game four. A game the Indians lost, and then this one in the first inning off the previously invincible Greg Maddox and Joe you feel that that home run was important not just because it gave the Indians the early lead. No but the one in the fifth game showed the Indians that we can go the other way and be successful off Maddox and we saw the rest of them trying to do the same. So that was more than just one single home run. It really showed the other players this guy is not invincible and if you take my lead and go the other way we can hurt him and they did and that's why they scored the four runs. Two and zero, the count, and that uh, that home run, Joe, preceded the high inside fastball that sent both benches onto the field when he knocked Murray back. Talking about Maddox, Murray's next. Clavin's two zero, way outside. It's very easy for a team to talk about let's go the other way take the guys the other way it's easy to talk about it but until you see someone do it successfully you really are not convinced and they saw Bell do it successfully and I think that turned the whole game around for the Indians. The 3 0 pitch walked him on four straight. Well Glavin in game two pitched behind on the count more often than he usually does he walked three men in only six innings uncharacteristic of him. And now he gives Bell a guy obviously you work carefully to but nonetheless he gives him a walk on four pitches. If you're the Atlanta Braves though Bob you say to yourself someone else is going to have to beat us other than Albert Bell and I think that's what you're seeing here they're going to not walk him every time but they're going to try to make perfect pitches on him. If they're successful OK if they're not then he goes to first base. Murray took a fat Glavin fastball over the wall in game two. And it's low for ball one. What effect do you feel a little stare down between Murray and Maddox in game five had on the Indians and the Braves Joe. I think it really excited the Indians. I don't think it really bothered the Braves that much. I don't think it bothered Maddox but I think it helped his ball club to get their adrenaline flowing. The runner going on one and oh Bell trying to steal and he's gone. Steal or hit and run. It would look like a hit and run. And in either case you're making Eddie Mary swing at a ball that he may not want to swing at. You see Bell taking off. It is definitely a hit and run. And you see he's out by a long ways when Matt, uh, when the changeup is swung on and missed by Murray. See that's a changeup. Swings and misses. And he's duck soup there for Lemke and Javier Lopez. How about the throw by Lopez right on the bag and a bullet. Bell stole only five bases all year. Obvious what Murray's going to see tonight, Joe. Yes. Glavin, fastballs, show me, change up, breaking ball, try and hit it. Two and two. You see Eddie Murray talking to Joe Brinkman. He was not happy with that call, but the first pitch, Glavin was not happy with. Well you know in, in watching all of these games in the World Series I think in, in looking at the home plate umpires 
everybody has been kind of liberal. They really have. I mean, off the outside corner, off the inside corner for strikes. He punches him out. departs in a foul humor. Well, he was upset at the two strike call by Brinkman. He didn't think that one was a good pitch and he still doesn't and he's letting Brinkman know what he thinks of the third one. But remember now this pitch is inside. Eddie is looking outside. All the other pitches were away and now Glavin busts him inside and that's what we were talking about in the open. He can stay away away but occasionally he's going to have to bust the hitters inside. I still think Murray's looking something off speed Joe first pitch he's sitting fastball most of the time other than that he thinks he's going to get the off speed stuff either a change up Lavin's got a great one or the curveball very sharp breaking curve he still doesn't believe that pitch and it wasn't all that bad the 0 1 to Ramirez inside. Tom Gladman was the 1991 National League Cy Young Award winner. 120 that season and the next two. A 16 game winner in the abbreviated 1995 campaign. Two balls and a strike. Did you see did you see Mike Hargrove grab Murray real quick like when he came in and started jawing at at the home plate umpire Hargrove backed him off said hey we need you for the game stay in the ball game that a B is gone with two out and nobody on the two one pitch apparently Martinez of the Indians is feeling all right now because O.J. and Poole have both taken a seat in the Cleveland bullpen. A tiny piece of it to stay alive. Bell blowing the bubble next to Hargrove, one of his coaches, and a former Indian player, terrific third baseman. The 2 2. If Glavin stays out there all night, he's going to be tough. That little change up, little screwball or riding fastball that he has to go away from those right handed batters, Joe. I mean, and, and Ramirez is, is one of those guys, he just doesn't seem to give up wanting to pull a ball. Yeah, we've often seen him reach for that pitch on the outside corner and roll weakly to third or short. Got him swinging for his second strikeout of the inning and his third in the first two frames. After one and a half, still no score. We talked about the Indians moving closer to the plate. See what he does when you move closer to the plate from this spot. That also moves the outside corner and then you end up with 17 inches from here to here and when they pitch you out there you will still swing at it because that is your strike zone. See that pitch is off the plate outside and the closer you move to the plate the more your strike zone moves away from the outside corner. You can't just change your strike zone overnight. That's one sentiment. On the other hand, I saw a banner just below that said, hey, Justice, hope your bat is as big as your mouth. And yeah, a mixed a reception. Of mixed reception. When uh -huh. he was first introduced before the game, nothing but boos. Now yep. as he comes to the plate, a mixture of boos and cheers. Well, he got their attention, Bob. He really did. They're up on their feet. And a strike to him. He's just three for 18 in the series.
One on one. That was kind of a tough headline in the paper this morning. I mean, I figured I'd get up, read the paper, and it would say, Braves back home to clinch. This is what the headline read this morning. Out of play. What happens if we don't win, said Justice? They'll probably run us out of Atlanta. And then he added, they might burn our houses down mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I actually thought the headline was a little tougher than the, <laughs> the, than the, than the article itself, though. I didn't think he really ripped them. Well, it's not the first time he's done it, Joe. Talked about fan support here or lack of it. If they win tonight or tomorrow, all will be forgotten and forgiven. He rips it foul. Justice hit 24 regular season home runs. He has not touched one off in the postseason in any of the three playoff rounds. Let's go next and then Lopez. Two and two. Ball down and in full count. Four of the first five games in this series decided by a single run. Bobby Cox has already managed 27 one run games in postseason. <laughs> and the last nine World Series defeats he suffered have all been by one run. There's a walk. And that's how the bottom of the second begins. Justice came from one and two on the count to get the base on balls. Well, they tried to get him to chase. That last one off of Martinez just missed very high. Justice checked in plenty of time. Here's that last fastball from Martinez and the check swing by Justice. Yep, no problem on that one. I'll tell you what. Joe, in watching Martinez here tonight, and he's, he's starting to get up into that high zone. Pena blocks that one. Tony Pena at age 38 is still an effective player if he plays once or twice a week. If you play him every day, he'll wear down. Well, that's what you want from your backup catcher. You want a guy that can play, you know, on an occasional basis. He's not supposed to play more than once or twice a week. And he'll do a good job for you. You're right. Lesko was on fire in Cleveland a homer in each game. Jose Mesa the Indian closer hadn't allowed a home run to a left handed batter all year. Until Klesko ripped one into the right field seats in the ninth against him in game five. Got a high fastball and he really juiced it. Three and oh. So after walking justice Martinez is now behind Klesko. As I said a minute ago Bob he, he's starting to get upstairs and he did it. He did it in the opening inning also where where he was missing on pitches upstairs and got away. And if you don't have that 90 plus 95 98 mile an hour fastball you're in you're in deep country there. Two consecutive walks to start the second. No one throwing in the Cleveland bullpen at this point but Hargrove on his way to the mound. And now they begin to stir again. With the exception of Nagy the scheduled starter for game seven. You're not saving anybody if you're in Mike Hargrove's situation. Now Bobby Cox might feel a little different. Maybe not a whole lot but a little different with the three two lead. Ken Hill now gets up the right hander and pool again the left hand. And again this is this is similar to what we saw from Martinez in his opening assignment here in Atlanta in game two. 
where, you know, he got by. I mean, he would he would he would tantalize you a little bit and then try to get you to chase off the outside or inside corner. And he was upstairs, Joe, as we talked during that game. And it's the same problem for him here tonight. He's starting to get upstairs and he doesn't throw that hard. And now Martinez has to face the guy who won game two against him with the home run to dead center. And in the at bat just prior to that, he pinned Albert Bell to the 385 sign in left center. Struggling with his control. Martinez brings it home, and a breaking ball is a strike. It's a beautiful pitch right there, knee high and away. Smart hitting by Lopez not to chase it, not to even hit it. It was a strike, but you do not want to hit swing at that on your first pitch. This hitter is pretty much the whole inning because the weak hitting Belliard is next and then the pitcher spot. So Martinez can survive it if he can get Lopez. Up and in, a ball and a strike. Lopez hit 315 for the year. Justice at second. Lesko at first. Two and one. We have to hesitate because Brinkman does. <laughs> I mean, you get the feeling he's thinking it over. He isn't really. He just doesn't want to let you in on it right away. He likes to keep it his own little secret for a while. It's, it's tough. You're right. But as I said earlier, I mean, he, he does it vocally. But it uh, takes him a long time to, to show you. 2 1 pitch. In the air to shallow left. Vizquel out. Bell in. Omar calling. Bell backs off, for which Omar is eternally grateful. And there's the first out. He pulled up real quick, didn't he? Well, he almost blew his spikes. Well, what's interesting there, I never saw anyone call the infield fly <laughs> rule on that. Might have been too far out there well, for them to call it. Yeah, but. but it's no such thing as too far out if he's under control, which he is, and he's and he can make the catch easily, which he was able to do. The idea being that with the runners retreating, he could drop it or right. let it fall on purpose and get the double play with the force at third and then a quick throw to second. Exactly. Belliard, hitless in the series, an RBI on his squeeze bunt in game one. The infield fly rule is to protect the offensive team, not to help the defensive team. Lavin on deck. Just about as dangerous as Belliard. They each hit 222. Raffi had seven RBIs. Glavin had eight. On the corner, one and one. Belliard hasn't had a homer since 1987. Glavin hit one this year. Glauser was the starter before the deep thigh bruise scratched him from the World Series. Back through the middle. Vizquel flags it down. The glove flip to Bayerga and on to first to get the diving Belliard on a gorgeous double play. A couple of walks in the end don't hurt Martinez because his defense bails him out. Great play there by Vizquel. He flips it. They do it without <laughs> touching it with two hands. Man, oh man. No score after two. A double play is very beautiful to watch, just to watch the coordination between the shortstop and the second baseman. And it doesn't get any better than this. A glove hand flip, a bare hand grab, and a toss to first base. That's about as good as you can make it. Perfect. Like your former teammate Dave Concepcion, Omar Vizquel is from Venezuela. Concepcion is one of his idols. What similarities and differences do you see? Well, I see they're both great shortstops. Vizquel's a lot flashier than Davey Concepcion, but that's the way that he plays. When I watch him, I see that he feels more comfortable, like flipping the ball there with his glove rather than taking it out. He feels more comfortable barehanding ground balls. Davey Concepcion was your fundamentally sound shortstop. He caught it with two hands and made the play. But this scale is very, very good. 
Bottom of the order in the top of the third against Glavin, Tommy Pena, Martinez. And there's strike one. Tommy has four postseason home runs. Three of them gave the Indians the lead. The one that didn't was his titanic shot off Brad Klontz in the bottom of the eighth in game five, and it turned out to be important. It made it 5-2, and they won it 5-4. You know, it upset a lot of the Braves players, too, that after Tommy hit that home run, he watched it and then flipped that bat up in the air, and it spun around a couple of times before it hit the ground, and then he went into his home run trot. <laughs> and a lot of these Braves players were hot about it. One and two. As a matter of fact, Joe, I don't know if you sense this or not, I think there's some ill feelings between these two clubs. Well, there are two different types of ball clubs, so I think that's the problem right there. Their personalities are different. He couldn't check, and he's gone for the fourth strikeout for Tom Glavin in two and a third. There's a breaking ball from Glavin, and Tomei couldn't check it. Again, you see that park. ball is off the outside mm -hmm. because they moved up closer. That ball looks like it's a strike. You know, you guys are definitely right. There's more of a swagger oh, about yeah. this Cleveland exactly. Indian ball club. It's well earned. They had the best percentage of any team since their predecessors, the 1954 Indians, 144. On the other hand, the Braves have been the team of the 90s, but they approach things in a different fashion, at least outwardly. Pena was 0 for 3 in game two. Hasn't played since then. I talked to Tony Pena at the beginning of the series. You know in the game four when he hit the game winning home run in the divisional series he had the take sign. He swung 3 and 0 oh, even though he had the take sign. Squibber back to the mound. Lavender McGriff for the second out. Beautiful Saturday night in Atlanta and the shot from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes from Pompano Beach Florida. The pilot is Dr. Jim Maloney. Did the former red right hander go and get a doctorate of some kind. <laughs> doctorate of air. A crescent moon. Mm -hmm. you. Isn't that nice. Kind of puts you in a romantic mood doesn't it. Stay back. <laughs> Here's Martinez <laughs> who put the ball in play both of his at bats here in game two not having swung a bat in a few years since he was with the Expos. He's up there hacking though. I like that. <laughs> you know what as a right hander I don't care if you're a pitcher or not there's a left hander out there you're taking your hacks. <laughs> if there's a right hander out there throwing that big nasty curve forget about it. <laughs> and that includes me. When it's bending into you, it's a lot you easier than right, when it's Joe. bending away. <laughs> Foul right it. back toward us. You had the call, but it was just, just. beneath us. <laughs> hey, this is not a bad swing at all. He's up there hacking. Off the outside corner, he had a good cut. Fans roaring on one and two and Glavin finishes the inning with his fifth strikeout through three. Tom Glavin will be the leadoff man in the last half of the third. Pitching very effectively so far. This season began with Glavin as the focal point for all the fan antagonism here. He was the player representative for the Braves and of all the player reps in baseball he was among the three or four most visible. You saw him on national TV constantly. He's a very articulate guy and the fans took it out on him. Now the thing has come full circle and if he comes through tonight he could be at the center of the biggest baseball celebration in Atlanta history. The Milwaukee Braves won the World Series against the Yankees in 57. The Atlanta Braves have never won a World Series. The Falcons have never been to the Super Bowl. The Hawks have never been to the NBA Finals. 
No Cleveland team has won a title since the 64 Browns beat the Colts. Something's got to give. Martinez to Glavin. Outside and high. Bob, along those same lines, all, the feeling of the players in the Braves clubhouse, sure, they wanted to win it last night, but they wanted Tom Glavin to be the guy to win it because he's been with this franchise the longest of all the pitchers. Since 87, as a matter of fact. And he is basically the foundation. He formed the foundation of this pitching staff in 87 and he's the guy that they have built it around so his teammates are all pulling for him to be the guy to win it for them. One and two a guy good enough to be the ace right ninety percent of the clubs in the major leagues he just happens to be the number two man here behind Maddox. That could all be over here tonight though talking about being number two Threw him the breaking ball he bounces it over to Tommy whose throw on the run is scooped up by Eddie Murray. Tommy has really improved this year defensively but that's what he will make do more than any other thing he will throw low to first base and make bad throws he has learned to catch the ball a lot better and he has actually become a guy that can play every day but he sometimes nonchalance the ball as you can see right there and he makes poor throws to first base great play there by Murray as we mentioned in game two Murray has played only 18 games at first base during the regular season mostly DHing. there was a time when he was gold glove quality or near gold glove quality with the Orioles, the Indians have made 18 errors in 14 postseason games. So the gloves have often betrayed them. Yeah, you said it right. He was gold glove quality. And Grissom takes inside. He lined hard to Murray to start the Atlanta first. Now they got a pitch outside his first time up as Martinez and Pena tried to stay down and away from him and he hit that rocket to Murray at first. They'll go that way again too. The 2 0 pitch popped wide of first and Murray will retire Grissom again. I don't know what it is Joe. Because in the earlier rounds of the playoffs, home field has not meant that much. But 34 of the last 47 World Series games have been won by the home team. You might attribute some of it to the DH, non DH, giving the home team an advantage playing under its rules, but that can't explain all of it. Well, I think part of it, Bob, is the fact that it doesn't matter. You play in one league all year long, you're familiar with all the ballparks. When you go to the other field, you're not familiar with those ballparks. It takes a little while to adjust. One and one to Lemke. In fact, Mike Hargrove told us before the game he feels more comfortable coming back here a second time. He said, you know, I didn't know the infield here. Right. I didn't know the dimensions of the park. And that happens to every team, every World Series. So I think that's hitting, the reason. Hitting backgrounds are different in every ballpark, Joe. You didn't like hitting in this ballpark. You said you couldn't pick the ball up here. No. And when you look out in center field, I mean, it looks like a pretty decent hitting background. But remember, they had people sitting out yeah. there before. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> That's where my passes were. <laughs> <laughs> Only the best for you, Yuke. Two and two. In contrast to the first, where he gave up a couple of singles and was bailed out when Lemke was caught stealing, and in the second, where he walked the first two men, and then a brilliant double play ended the inning. Martinez is cruising through the third. Bayerga retires the side in order and will return after this from your local station. Top of the order in the top of the fourth, Lofton, Vizquel, and Bayerga. Kenny hit the ball hard his first time up, sending Justice nearly to the track in right center. That's the only fly ball out by either side through three innings. Strike one. You only hope the next pitch isn't on the way before you learn the outcome of the preceding pitch from Joe Brinkman. 
you know, I, I would just figure that a that a World Series game, calling balls and strikes, you'd really want to fire that right arm out there. But I mean, that's the way he does it all the time. So I guess he's not going to change no matter where we are. Which is not to say his calls no. are inaccurate or that he's not a good umpire. Well, let's say that too. <laughs> Just for the heck of it, or yeah. because you think? Hey, why not? It's our last night. <laughs> well, you can. In that case, if you have any personal beefs or anything you'd like to get off your chest, I encourage you. <laughs> One thing I want to get off my chest is you. <laughs> <laughs> Lavin ahead, one and two. Reaches for it, rolls it to first. McGriff to the bag himself for the first out. Here's Vizquel. <laughs> Glavin struck him out the first time. At the knees, a strike. <laughs> this guy always looks like he's in pain or always having problems or sickly during the game. You know, he really does. <laughs> I didn't mean sick like that, but. Vizquel trying to bunt, fouls it off. The Indians do not have a hit yet against Glavin. He's walked one and struck out five. Further proof of one of baseball's verities about good pitching stopping good hitting Indians hit 291 for the year best team batting average since the 1950 Red Sox 202 in this World Series they average 5.8 runs a game for the year in the series 3.8 the 0 2. That was just to keep Vizquel honest on the inside. He had thrown two change-ups away, so he comes off the plate inside 0-2. Goes back away. You know, fans sometimes wonder, Joe, how you can keep doing that time after time after time. But when these guys work year after year after year, spring training after spring training, I mean, that's, that's, that's nothing. I mean, you can do that nine out of ten times, right in the same spot. Check swing foul. And two he and did. Two. <laughs> well, one of the nice. points I, I'm sorry about. One of the points say, I want to make is that in the first three innings during the year he gave up 40 runs. The rest of the innings he only gave up 36. So the point is, if you don't get him early, you usually do not get Glavin. And we're now in the fourth inning. He's gone for the sixth strikeout recorded by Glavin. Breaking ball down and in, and Vizquel wants to know if it was a called strike or if he said he didn't check his swing. And he, he's uh, he's he's asking a little more than that from Joe Brinkman. He's satisfied now, but I mean there was no hesitation on Brinkman's part. Watch him pull back on this one. None of that slow, deliberate call there. He jumps up and bang. Here it is one more time. Breaking ball low and inside. From that angle, it looked like he went. And Joe Brinkman pop it up and bang, you're out of there. Now Bayerga, who tapped to the mound to end the first. Fastball outside. What I was going to say a moment ago, Joe, was just how nice it is for a guy like Lopez, or any catcher for that matter. You got a guy like Glavin out there, man, hitting the outside corner. You set up out there and bang, you just sit. Two and oh. We're in the fourth, no score. Game six. Tried the corner and missed. Three and oh. Watch Lopez. Watch how he sets the target out there. He moves just a little bit, just a little off the corner, but normally he sets up out there and Glavin hits the target. Like that. If there is a game seven, Nagy against Smoltz, but everybody goes to the bullpen, including Avery, who would be well rested. There's Smoltz. Maddox on two days rest. Hershiser on two days rest. And Bayerga with a high pop into shallow center coming in as Grissom. Glavin has held the Indians hitless through four.
Welcome back to the World Series in Atlanta. I'm Jim Gray. I'm now joined by the 39th President of the United States, President Carter and Mrs. Carter. Great to see you both. President Carter, you have mediated crises all across the world. And last year, you offered your services to Major League Baseball in their labor dispute. Would you offer your services again? And briefly, what solution might you put to them? Well, if they need me, I would certainly offer the full services of the Carter Center because we're experts on negotiation and mediation. And I'm afraid that if the uh, players and owners don't reach an agreement soon, that it's going to be a much more damaging effect having a deadlock even than it was uh, last year. So, yes, we would be available, but if they could get along without us, that's the best way to do it. I guess the best thing now about being a former president, Mr. Carter, is that you can now root. All those years in the White House, you weren't allowed to root, and you're a long-suffering Braves fan, aren't you? Well, I'm rooting for the Braves, you know, watching TV and so forth. And uh, I'm so proud of the Braves. They've done, they've done better the last five years than any other team in baseball. So we have confidence that they're going to do well tonight. President and Mrs. Carter, it's great to see you. I know you have a book coming out, Amy Illustrated at Christmas. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Sir. Bobby's still got quite an arm as well. Yeah, he zipped that first pitch of the night up there. <laughs> Better than just about any ceremonial first pitch thrower I've seen recently. Well, Chipper, you... Chipper Jones hit the first pitch from Martinez in this inning sharply, but Bayerga flagged it down at second, and that brings up McGriff, who struck out his first time. When you talked about everybody in the bullpen tomorrow night, after looking at him the first pitch tonight he may be there too. 43 mile an hour gasser. <laughs> I think that was only his changeup actually. McGriff rips one and Bayerga's got this from the outfield grass two down. Nice play there by Bayerga. You know he has a bad ankle but I mean moved very quickly on the ball and comes up with two pretty good plays here. This ball is ripped breaking ball down and McGriff rips it toward the hole. See, Bayerga reaches out, comes up with it, takes his time, and throws it. Says he feels better today than he has the entire series. And you can see he's moving better. Earlier, his manager, Mike Hargrove, had pegged him at only about 75% with the sprained ankle that may actually be more than a sprain. There may be some ligament damage there. He's playing through clenched teeth. Here's Justice, walked his first time. Check swing foul past Jimmy Williams in the third base coach's box. You know, Joe, looking at Martinez here in the last couple of innings, he's starting to settle down now in difference to the opening inning where everything was upstairs. As a matter of fact, into the second when he walked Justice and Klesko before getting out of it with a double play. But he's, he's starting to settle down now. Fastball sinker down low, breaking stuff is low. Some of the fans, not many, but some reacting to that. It wasn't even close, but they're mindful of what happened with Maddox and Murray in game five and looking for any sort of repeat of that. Hit hard, left center field, Lofton sprinting over, can't get to it. Cuts it off before the track, but Justice will challenge him, sprinting for second and in with a double. Lofton Joe has a very good arm. That was an excellent play by Lofton just to make it that close. He had a long way to go to cut it off and then had to stop his momentum, turn and fire a strike to second base. Justice will go the other way and he finds the gap in left center field. Now watch Lofton. I mean, he's going full speed to just to cut it off. Now watch him. He stops quickly and makes an accurate throw. That is very difficult to do. But he made it a close play at second base. Look how accurate this throw is. Perfect throw there. Oh, and what a tough slide. What a hard slide at second by Justice Joe. He looked like he got down a little bit too late. You saw his front leg pop off the bag. It looked like he almost jammed it. An intentional walk now to Klesko. Almost unbelievably, that was Justice's first extra base hit of the entire postseason. Well, it's a pick your poison deal here. Klesko has been hot. Lopez, on the other hand, burned Martinez in game two. But Lopez is a right handed hitter. And Klesko for the year hit 331 against right handed pitching, 310 overall. So they give him the pass, and this probably makes sense. 
and they'll take their chances with Lopez. But it will tell you how Hargrove is going to play the remainder of this ball game, Bob, because normally in this situation, I know that Klesko has been swinging the bat well, but you try to get him out because the more runners you put on base and then somebody finds a gap or they get a base hit, the more trouble you're in. And you just cannot afford to fall too far behind in this ball game. Let's flash back to game two, sixth inning. And Martinez put one out over the plate. He knew it was fat. You saw him bow his head after Lopez connected. That proved to be the decisive blow as the Braves took a 2-0 lead in the series. Cleveland won two of three at home to bring it back here. Ball one. Eric Plunk gets up for the first time. It's the third time Poole has been up and throwing the left-hander. Crowd chanting Javi, Javi. Two and zero after two out, a double by Justice, an intentional walk to Cusco. And a threat in the Atlanta fourth. No sooner do we talk about Martinez getting into a zone where he's staying downstairs and he's starting to miss upstairs now, and Murray's coming over to talk to him. But remember one thing he's throwing from the stretch now. And we, we sometimes forget that it is more difficult for a pitcher when you get him into a stretch to get the ball down and to bend his back. That's Kenny Hill saying hurry. Yep. Get That's ready. That's the quick. hurry sign. He said this is for real. <laughs> the 2 0. 3 0. Now Belliard is next. I'm, I'm going. I'm going. You're letting him hit you. Absolutely. Yes. I don't think there's any doubt that yep. he has this green light. But Dennis Martinez also knows that maybe he'll throw one just out of the strike zone and he will <laughs> chase it. Check swing foul. Looked like it would have been ball four. Mm -hmm. That'll tell you he was going too. Or hitting. Yes. If you will. High inside fastball for Martinez. And Lopez. As we thought. Green light 3-0. Now you, now you may try to finish him with a breaking ball, get him to chase something here. For the second straight at bat, Lopez is the key man for Martinez. He got him to pop up back in the second with two on and nobody out. Now two on, two out, and the 3 1 pitch. Did he go around again? He did. Same pitch. Running in on him. Mm -hmm. Look, Martinez is as smart as you get when you're standing out there on the rubber. He knows that Lopez is swinging. He knows that he's anxious, so he will not throw him a strike. And again, that pitch is off the plate, but Javi commits too far. I mean, this pitch, you can't do anything with it if you hit it. That's what Dennis Martinez is saying to himself. The runners will take off on the 3-2 pitch, and Martinez looks justice, the lead runner, back. That'll happen sometimes to a pitcher. He'll come up into the stretch. The ball doesn't feel right, and the pitch that he is about to throw doesn't feel right in his hand for this particular pitch. And he knows that this is a big pitch in the World Series, so he did the right thing by stepping off. Baseball is a game of subplots, and it could very well be that in the offseason, what we'll think about is this little mini battle, Martinez and Lopez. They have faced each other in three crucial situations. In the two games Martinez has pitched. Lopez won the big one with his sixth inning homer in game two. There they go and here it comes. He walked them. They're loaded for Belliard. Would you hit for Belliard this early in the game? I would not. You know when we asked Bobby Cox before the game if Mordecai might get a shot at playing shortstop. He said I'm staying with Belliard. He said as a matter of fact. Even in the sixth inning, when I do sometimes pinch hit for him, I hate to do it because I lose defense. And Bobby Cox's philosophy is pitching and defense first. He did hit for Rafi very early in game five. 
Well, he thought he had a chance of putting it away right then. That's why he had to do it. Or getting, you know, he wanted to get right back in it right then. So I think today is a whole different scenario. He's got a well, a Glavin was well rested. He's pitching well. Bases loaded two out. And Belliard went around for strike one. He's now 0 for 13 in the series. Although he made a bid for his first hit in the second bouncing one over the mound and Vizquel started a brilliant double play with a glove hand flip to Bayerga who barehanded it on the pivot and got it over to Murray to complete the 6 4 3 that got them out of the inning. Here's the 0 1. Breaking ball hit in the air to left. Bell and Lofton and Lofton and left center for the catch. They leave the bases loaded. Still scoreless after four. A city hoping it's on the brink of a celebration. There's no question that the Braves have been baseball's finest team over the last five years. Third time in the World Series. Fourth time in postseason play. And the only season in that stretch they didn't make it to the postseason. Nobody did. Last year when everything stopped on August 12th. But what the Indians are trying to do is not unprecedented. A handful of clubs have come from behind three games to one. Another handful have won the last two on the road as they would have to do here. A foul ball off Bell's back. He hit 50. As you know to lead the major leagues 10 more than anybody else in either league the Indians as a team hit 207 if you project that to 162 games a full season it comes to 232 not far off the all time record of 240 foul back 0 and 2 that was set by the Maris and Mantle 1961 Yankees so that's how powerful a club the Cleveland Indians were this year. That may be the best pitch that Albert Bell gets at at Glavin in this particular A.B. That was a mistake from Glavin right down Main Street and he fouled it back. Down and away one and two. Bell walked his first time up. Then on a blown hit and run he was cut down stealing. Skips rope a bit two and two. They've walked him six times Joe in the last five games. Well they've decided he's not going to beat them and, and you have to choose one of the, the guys in this lineup that you think it hurt you the most. And Bell has proven to be that person for the Braves. So he's not going to beat them unless they just get in a bases loaded situation where they have to give in. Still two and two. Glavin has faced the minimum 12 hitters through four. The only man he's allowed to reach was Bell on a leadoff walk in the second. After he was caught stealing, Glavin's house was back in order. The Indians still looking for their first hit. Full count. How many times a game does Cox remove <laughs> the hat, remove the glasses? Seems like it's an every pitch ritual for him. A little roller foul. Bell had to take off just in case it rolled back across the chalk. A good hustle by Bell that time because Lopez had that thought in mind. Let that ball roll and see if it comes back into fair territory. And if you're standing there after you've hit the ball thinking it's going to be a foul ball, look at that ball kind of spinning toward the line. You, that had more English on it than Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> oh, wow. I'll see you guys back at the hotel. <laughs> it was now or never, pal. Oh, yeah, I know. You've been waiting all year. <laughs> oh. 
Another 3 2 pitch. In the air down the right field line. Deep but foul. He was born in Scotland, by the way. Did you know that? Mr. Belvedere Absolutely. was? Absolutely. Yep. Christopher Hewitt, sure. I didn't know that. Well, you do now, pal. Here we out there saying, who's Mr. Belvedere? <laughs> still in syndication, isn't it? The checks are still coming, aren't they? And he walked him. Well, the only two walks Glavin has issued have both been to Bell, and it's not a lack of control. It's purposeful, pitching very, very carefully to the Indian cleanup hitter. Let's watch the sequence of pitches. Eddie Murray's last at bat, Joe. Well, I said Glavin would have to stay away, just pitch to his strength, and you see him doing so there, staying away, away, but then you also have to keep them honest by coming inside. Right there, that's strike three. You get a hitter looking away, and then you can bust him inside anytime you want. How surprised were you by that little maneuver by Hargrove in the second with Bell at first? He sends him with Murray at the plate. Well, I was surprised if it was a hit and run. I was really surprised. If it was a straight steal, maybe Bell just took off. And he pops it up. Who will it be? Jones or Lopez? Lopez in foul ground. Murray is now just two for 19 in the World Series, but the first hit was a homer, and the second was the game winner in the bottom of the 11th in game three. Now well, these fans in Atlanta kind of taunting Murray. They're hollering, Eddie, Eddie, as they do in uh, Cleveland. You had a tough time, tough series. Ramirez struck out in the second inning. 254 for 16 in the series. Ball one. But think who those left handed pitchers have been for the most part. And that's the good couple, point. Couple of starts against Randy Johnson, couple now against Tom Glavin, throw in Steve Avery. You look at the way the Braves outfield is playing Ramirez. I mean, they're almost telling him how they're going to pitch him. Look at Grissom playing well in the right center field. Justice only about 40 feet off the line and right. They're, they're saying, we're going away on you. The 2 0, but first, the toss to first and. Bell is back easily. Lavin waiting as Ramirez sets himself in the box. Foul. Two and one. They just keep working him away, Joe. I mean, time after time and game after game, and he's still trying to still trying to pull that outside pitch. No, and, he, and they keep mixing the speeds on him. I think that's really what's bothering him. They will throw a fastball out there, he doesn't catch up with it. And then when they throw the change up out there, he's trying to catch up with what he thinks is a fastball, so he ends up pulling it and topping it. And you can see by that graphic during the year, he went to the opposite field with great success. Ought to go back. To his original approach. Hit toward the hole. Belliard to his right, scoops it up, gets the force, there'll be no throw. And Bell is exchanged for Ramirez. Two out now in the fifth. And for all of those people who are wondering why Bobby Cox did not pinch hit for Belliard in the bottom of the fourth with the bases loaded, that is an example right there. He knows that he needs Belliard's glove in a game that's this tight when you have a good pitcher on the mound like Glavin. This is not a routine play far more difficult than it looked but Belliard made it look routine and that's why they want him out there. Now Tommy who struck out his first time. Ball one. Ramirez at first. 
Two down on the top of the fifth. Indians nothing, Braves nothing. Game six. Swing and a miss. Now this pitch is a little bit upstairs, off speed. And Tomei tried to take it out of here. One more time. Change of pace, a little upstairs though. Glavin didn't want it there and Tomei out in front. We talked to the first time Glavin pitched, we talked about the fact that he had trouble against left-handed pitchers. And we noted that was because he was so far toward the third baseline and couldn't get a good angle for his curveball. But what we've seen him do to adjust is throw more change-ups to left-handers than he had in the past. The one one. One and two. And they're on their feet again here in Atlanta. Determined to prove Dave Justice wrong. They're ready for game six. Relatively quiet last weekend. Nothing like the ruckus they raised in Cleveland. Different atmosphere tonight. Two and two. Atlanta's first couple, at least in the baseball season. Anyone at bat, any one pitch could, in retrospect, be the World Series. The 2 2. Full count. And a small edge to the Indians as Ramirez will be running from first. And this is a good at bat for Tome, even though he. Swung and missed, took strike two. He has still made Glavin work in this at bat, and it's not over yet. Struck him out. Seven strikeouts through five. Hasn't allowed the Indians a hit. Georgia Governor Zell Miller alongside Jane Fonda. Showing his approval, as does the rest of the 52,000 plus. Here is Tom Glavin's last offering to Tommy. A beautiful changeup. Had him out front, strikes him out for number seven. And you look at Jane and Ted. What's the reaction? Ted Turner right there. Yes! <laughs> Ted Turner of course has a much higher profile internationally and in American business than just the owner of the Atlanta Braves but he is a much different sort of baseball owner than he was back in the 70s. He wanted to manage then. Glavin leads off and Martinez offers ball one. In fact he did put himself in uniform. Yep. They were in the midst of a 16 17 game losing streak sometime in the late 70s. He managed one game lost it by a run as I remember. Bowie Kuhn said no you can't do that. And, <laughs> and so he had to go back into the owner's box. But there was a time when he was widely perceived as among the negative influences in the game. Profligate spending throwing money at free agents throwing the salary structure out of whack and no winning teams to show for it. The team a laughing stock and then he stepped aside brought in Bobby Cox eventually John Schurholtz. They built a terrific franchise a team that looks like it'll be in good shape as Glavin is caught looking not just this year but beyond. They've got a very deep farm system. They always have a lot of options when it comes to making trades and he can just sit back now and enjoy the fruits of his labor and the labors of Cox and Schurholtz and the rest of a very fine organization. 
He threw money at a lot of people, even if you weren't a player. Back in those days. The strikeout for Martinez. As he put Glavin away was just his second. Grissom's 0 for 2. Fastball hit hard and foul. He may have broken his yep. bat on that uh, jamming fastball, but eh, it looks like he's all right. And one more time. You saw where that ball hit down around the trademark. And Grissom thought he broke his bat. Hit it foul by about three feet. Bottom of the fifth, no score. Shallow center field, Bayer go back from second base. Two quick outs. In the first inning, he threw Grissom a fastball away, lined it towards right field. Eddie Murray made the catch. Since that time, he has come up and in the last two times at bat, and he has jammed Grissom and gotten pop ups. So he adjusted to the fact that he saw Griffin Grissom going the other way in the first inning. Scoreless game. The two real threats have belonged to Atlanta. Had a couple on with nobody out in the second. Had the bases loaded with two out in the fourth. A ball to Lemke, who singled and grounded out. One and one. Lemke punched a single between Tommy and Biscale his first time up. It looks to me like Tommy is a little bit further off the line and toward the hole in this at bat. Definitely. Two and one. That's why and this is true of other sports in different ways but you watch the highlights of a baseball game they may be exciting but they don't tell you everything what happens now is dependent upon what happened before and some of what happens now is meant to set up what might happen next. Two one pitch. Breaking ball Pena held it there hopeful of the call from Brinkman didn't get it. That's Tony Pena now shouting at Martinez make him swing the bat make him swing the bat. Well it was obvious that he wanted to call a fastball Martinez shook him off to get to the curveball and that's why he's saying no throw a fastball make him swing the bat. Fastball or was it. Yes. Yep. Sinking fastball. Sinker. Well, that's, what, that's exactly there he is right there. You see Tony Pena. A catcher can tell you everything about this game and what's going on. Especially and basically, read lips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and basically says, turn the ball loose. Let this guy hit. Well, Lemke hit only five homers all year. And you've got the dangerous guy, Chipper Jones, next. Two outs. Come after him. Yeah, I mean, you, you take your shot here with this guy. I mean, throw it right down the pipe if he hits it out of here. I mean, you got to give him a little bit of credit, too. Rather than walk him as you suggested Bob with Jones coming up next. It's amazing though when you watch Glavin and Martinez or any veteran pitcher for that matter they, they just really hate to give in. Right. To any hitter in any situation they hate to do it. And he walks him with two out he'll have to face Chipper Jones. Even there, he did something different with the pitch. He threw in two sinking fastballs, and then he tried to ride the fastball up and away to strike him out. Wrong pitch. That's Martinez's fifth walk. One was intentional. Pool again going to wear himself out just getting up and down in the pen. Ball one high and away to Jones who singled to the opposite field and then grounded sharply to Bayerga at second base.
slow roller right side. Bayerga has to charge. Bare hands and makes no throw. Jones took a tumble as he crossed first, beating out the infield hit, but he's okay. Well, you've got two left-handed batters now, McGriff and Justice. He's had the lefty pool up. That was Martinez's 81st pitch, so it's doubtful he would have gone more than another inning anyway beyond the sixth. We're in the fifth now. So if Hargrove wants to make a move, there's some logic behind it, and he will. Forty-year-old Dennis Martinez has thrown his last pitch of a fine season. And as Jim Poole comes in, we step aside for a moment. Well, let's take a look at this last ground ball. This was a good pitch by Martinez. The ball is chopped to the right side. Now watch, Bayerga has played very well defensively. What happens here, see, he has a chance to get him. But what happens is he caught the ball in the palm of his hand. He didn't catch it in his fingers. Watch right here. He's got it in the palm. And if you throw the ball like that, a palm ball, you may throw it away. So he wisely does not throw it first. And you see Chipper Jones tripping over Eddie Murray's foot. And he goes tumbling. Let's take another look at it. See, trips over his left his right foot who was, which was on the bag. Chipper Jones was Martinez's last hitter. On comes the 29 year old left hander Jim Poole to face McGriff with justice on deck. Now the pitcher spot is due second in the top of the sixth. It'll be interesting because if Poole should get McGriff to end the inning There'd be two lefties, Justice and Klesko, in the next inning. So they might let Poole bat for himself in the top half of the sixth, if only to pitch to two batters in the bottom half. But this is the one he has to get. McGriff has struck out, then was robbed of a hit on a fine play by Vierga. Strike one. One would have to guess that Joe Brinkman is not a hyperactive guy. He might be the most relaxed man in this ballpark, working home plate. The 0 1. He's ahead of him quickly. Now, this is the luxury that Hargrove has had throughout the year with, with the Ossenmachers and the Pools and Tavares and Plunk going left hander, right hander, left hander, right hander, depending on, on who it is you're facing. Ahead now to McGriff, two strikes. Yeah. On three pitches, he ends the threat. Hargrove's move pays off. No score after five. Only a couple of walks to Albert Bell have marred Tom Glavin's performance thus far. And marred might not even be the right word because he was being very careful intentionally with Bell. The former Brave, Charlie Liebrandt, the last pitcher to throw five hitless innings at the start of a game in the World Series. Game six for the Royals, a series in which he pitched brilliantly with no victories to show for it. Game six at home against the Cardinals. That was the game with a controversy at first. Don Denkinger with a safe call on George Orta. Cardinals winning one nothing as they went to the ninth. Royals rallying for two to tie the series winning 11 nothing the next night. Pena is the hitter. Tony was out on a comebacker his first time up. Two and oh. Nope. <laughs> I should have I should have waited. Huh? <laughs> Jim Poole on deck has spent his entire career in the American League. He was with the Orioles before the Indians. Other than spring training, he has never batted in a game. 
in a game that mattered. And I'm not so sure he should bat in this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justice and Klesko, two left handed hitters, start the bottom of the sixth for Atlanta. Right. But let me, but the closer you get to the ninth inning in a tie ball game and you're down three to two, the more the pressure swings on you. Hits softly into shallow center and it drops in front of Grissom. He kicks it, Pena with a wide turn, Justice backing up, and that's the first hit. Now the question is, can Poole bunt? Yeah, that's fine. I think it, you shouldn't hit, as I, it would still be my point. See, good job there of ju by Justice of backing up the play because Pena started for second, and you see Justice backs up Grissom and keeps Pena at first base. Now the interesting thing here, too, Joe, is to, is to watch Poole. I mean, he's up there left-handed against the left-hander Glavin to see if he's going to keep himself in there, make himself stay in there to try and bunt a ball. Chipper Jones just about close enough to shake his hand. He gets the bunt down foul. Tell you what he did a good job on that bunt. I mean he really tried to kill it. You could see him pull the bat back and really try to kill the ball. Bunted it foul but he stayed in there. If you're the Braves in this situation you let Chipper come way in. Go ahead and throw the fastball away because that's probably where he's going to end up bunting it and you may end up with a double play. If you throw a good fastball away and he gets and he doesn't deaden it down the third baseline you've got a chance for a double play. So this pitch should be away. Just stay away. He pops it back and he's in an 0-2 hole. Payne has got to be careful at first too. I mean a bunt attempt and that guy behind the plate coming out firing. We've seen it happen before. There's very little doubt that they keep the bunt on even with two strikes because they can't have any confidence in pool as a hitter. Absolutely. I mean he's staying in there pretty good. But he's fouled a couple. He squares and he bunts it up in the air. It doesn't matter but McGriff catches it anyway. He would have been out on the foul bunt with two strikes. Well, the fastball is away and up, and he pops it up. And as you said, McGriff really should not even chase this ball because there's not anything you can do. If you catch it and fall down, then the guy at first may be able to tag up and go to second. So just let it drop, and it's an automatic strikeout anyway. Not a bad move at all, though, by Hargrove. No, no. Poole just couldn't get the bunt down. Now here's Lofton. Who has flied to justice in fairly deep right center and grounded softly to first. Back to the mound. Glavin to Belliard. Can they get Lofton? No. Just about anybody else. And the inning's over. Here it is one more time. Broken bat bouncer right back to Glavin. Ballyard coming across the bag. And as you said, Bob, anybody else? Yes. Not Lofton. There again, Ballyard coming across to take a nice throw from Glavin. And the Lofton beat it. And he'll run to any time. They've caught him once in this series. Javi Lopez back of the plate now cut him down in game three. He's been successful five times. But we'll see if Glavin uses a slide step to get the ball to home plate quicker 
and give Lopez a shot at Lofton if he does go. Not going outside. Outside corner. You know, I've got to stop <laughs> guessing with this guy Brinkman. You can't do it. I mean, working behind this guy, you know, during the regular season and 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 trying to do play-by-play, -play, Bob. It just, I mean, you have to really hold off on him. I mean, most of the other umpires are, are pretty consistent. There are a few guys that that do that, but uh, yeah, if you had him, Mike, you'd feel a lot better. You'd know sooner. I'm just going to ask him to fax the call up to the booth. Would arrive at about the same mm -hmm. time. <laughs> he goes and they've got him picked off, but he may steal it anyway, and he does. There's speed and then there's game changing speed. There's intimidating speed. I remember Maury Wills doing that in the 1963 series for the Dodgers against the Yankees. That's the kind of play Ricky Henderson or Lou Brock might make. Well I don't think he would have picked Maury off. <laughs> but in this case he, he, he took a little too long to get the ball to first base. That was a problem. He gave him the slow deliberate move and he had him going but Lofton kept going. And it's 0 2 now to Vizquel. Now, watch how long it takes Glavin to get the ball to first base. See, that's that slow move, and he was off with the first movement. See, he's going all the way. No chance for McGriff really to get him at second base. Now, the 0 2. Didn't miss by much. Next time you see Maury Wills, I think it was Al Downing. It's either oh. Downing or Ford. I think it was Downing who picked him off first base in a game at Yankee Stadium, and Maury just kept on going to second. Yeah, I'm not. I just know that Tom Glavin wouldn't have picked him. Oh, off. I see. Okay. <laughs> Glavin hasn't picked off anybody this year, <laughs> <laughs> so he's not going to pick Maury Wills off. I guarantee you that. Yeah, Glavin started tonight without having any pickoffs. And Lopez out now for a couple of words with Glavin. Take a look at Justice and Wright. Joe playing very, I mean, rather deep for Vizquel here. Although we saw in that series in Cleveland, that ball he drove to the right field corner for a three-base hit. Every once in a while, I mean, he can turn around on you, this time right-handed, to do it to the left field side. But Justice playing him rather deep. In right with two outs here. And Lofton with great speed at second. You know it's a tense spot when the cap comes off, the glasses come off for Bobby Cox. Lofton in scoring position. Two down and a sixth. Scoreless game. And Vizquel hangs in. Glavin has fanned him both times tonight. And you saw him try to take that ball to right field that time. Try to reach out and punch one to right. It'd be a great time. I mean, you're you're ahead in the count. You got a guy looking away like that, Joe, to bust him inside, breaking ball down, low and in. So tough to check your swing. He goes for third. And it's popped wide of first. McGriff is over lots of foul ground here. And he's got it. Lofton is certainly not bashful. Still no score. We've talked about how a base dealer can help a hitter sometimes. Well, in this case, I think he hurt his hitter. With two strikes, Lofton running, it seemed to distract the scale. And his reactions after all this happened, he was very upset. And he looked at Lofton, then he went over and talked to Tomei. You do not want to take your hitter's concentration away from the pitcher with two strikes. And Vizquel was very upset with Lofton on that play. Pull back out to work to justice. And a strike called as we move to the bottom of the sixth. 
the Indians managed their first hit of the game in the top half off Glavin, a soft single into right center by Tony Pena. He has been masterful, though, speaking of Glavin. This is the Tom Glavin that I expected to see in the second game of, you know, the third game of the series. But this is the real Tom Glavin today. One one pitch. A long drive to right. Ramirez turns to the track. She's gone. Day of justice. All is forgiven in Atlanta. Bob, it's okay to talk the talk if you can walk the walk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Strike one to Klesko. Well, they thought they had justice really set up. They did. <laughs> Set up in the right field seats. Bounced over the mound by Erga. On the run gets Klesko. Prior to tonight, Justice had not had an extra base hit in the entire postseason. Tonight he's walked, doubled, and now homered. Well, they threw him a breaking ball away. They tried to come inside with a fastball. They tried to come inside with a fastball, and Justice was ready for it. They thought they had him set up by going away with a breaking ball and then trying to come back inside. Well, he turned on that ball so awfully quick. Prime time justice? <laughs> or is it served? Well, over in the other dugout, Mike Hargrove did a perfectly logical thing. He asked Paul to bunt. He couldn't do it. Two dangerous left-handed hitters to begin the inning, Justice and Klesko. Poole had struck McGriff out on three pitches to end the fifth. It all made sense, but Justice turned Hargrove's logic to lament. Tommy back of third, across the diamond. Got him. Well, if this score holds up, and it's only 1-0, and it's only the sixth, but Glavin has been very, very sharp, maybe tomorrow's headlines will involve Dave Justice in a much different way. Belliard now. And this is where Bobby Cox is very happy. That he didn't get jittery and bat for Belliard earlier. Now he has the lead in a close game and he has his best available defensive shortstop still in there. Now, no matter what has taken place thus far, and the Braves have the lead now, this has been a great ball game. It really has. I mean, Martinez and Glavin and, and Poole here giving up the home run to Justice. Martinez went four and two thirds in trouble a bit but didn't yield any runs. Tommy can't get it. Belliard's aboard. If they want to be very nice to him it's his first hit of the series but they could give Tommy an error. That was a ball that Tommy should have played easily. Never got the glove down. Here it is easy bouncer hit by Belliard. That ball never came up on him, stayed down, and Tommy didn't go down to get it. He never touches it, and I mean, they could call it a base hit by, by all rights, it should be an error, and it is. Should have been an easy play for Tommy. Glavin now. A strike to him. Justice has given him the lead. 
in the bottom of the sixth. Justice with McGriff. Oh, and two. Belliard at first. And even if they get out of the inning with the score still 1 0, that error matters because you could have Glavin leading off in the seventh. Instead, you're going to have to face the true leadoff man, Grissom, even if they get Glavin here. Could make the seventh a much more difficult inning for Cleveland. There are a lot of times in baseball when a guy will make an error and they get out of the inning and we will say an error didn't hurt. The error didn't hurt him. But it always hurts because you give the other team an extra out. And any time you give the other team an extra out, it will catch up with you over the course of the entire ball game. Tapper foul. And even the five walks issued by Martinez, Joe, I mean, it, it changes right. the order down That's to the end of the game. Every time you walk somebody and and nobody scores everybody that's ah, a meaningless walk not so in a close game as you said down the end of the ball game all the batting orders change yes. Two and two. You know, looking at Glavin here against the left-hander, he hangs in there pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's he's up there taking his hacks. Curveball's not backing him away. I mean, he's he's had good swings. Well, he hit 222 for the year and had a home run. And he runs the count out full. Ken Hill, the Indians' fourth starter, the right-hander, throwing again in their bullpen. Might come on if Poole loses Glavin. And he's going to make him work for it. Well, now it's kind of like batting practice for Glavin. He's sitting up there looking fastball. I mean, if he throws you a breaking ball, forget about it. He's looking fastball. You're up there hacking. Murray playing behind Belliard, who takes off, and Glavin. Lines one and Vizquel makes a leaping catch of the soft line drive. Good at bat for Glavin, but he goes down. Lead off homer by Justice. One nothing. Glavin and company still have six very big outs to get. And because they have stranded 11 runners, they have only a one nothing lead on the Justice home run. But if they should accomplish this, they would become the first franchise in baseball history to win world championships in three different cities all the way back to 1914 for a world championship by the Boston Braves in 57 the Milwaukee Braves and perhaps in 95 the Atlanta Braves. You know you talked earlier Bob about the 57 and 58 Braves losing to the Yankees New York coming from behind in 58. A lot of people thought they should have won three or four years down the road. Tommy on the first pitch here in the eighth sends a long drive into left center field and Grissom runs it down on the warning track. This is the big out for Blavin. Simply because Tommy is could be the last power hitter that they'll have to face in this ball game, and he hits a fly ball in the left center field. He almost got it out of here. Grissom, of course, very good center fielder. He runs it down and makes the catch in left center field. Now 
They need one more man to reach base in this inning or the next right. to give Albert Bell another crack at it. Pena has the only hit. Until that last shot off Tommy's bat, the hardest hit ball against Glavin was probably his first hitter, Lofton, who sent Justice to the edge of the track in right center to lead off the game. Waller's the closer, Borbone, who was very effective, his last stand out of the bullpen, the left hander. Down and away, 2 0. Oh. for a strike two and one you know you talk Joe about getting Bell up there a guy who can who can hit with power definitely every once in a while this guy Tony Pena is going to look for a pitch something inside if he gets something inside he'll drive it well he hit five in the regular season and then one game one of the division series against his old Red Sox <laughs> teammates with a surprise shot into the left center field seats yep. on a 3 0 pitch at Jacobs Field. Nagy hoping they get the hand in the ball in game seven tomorrow night against Smoltz if it goes that far. Two and two. You know, you talk about Pena trying to juice one out of here. Then you got Glavin on the other side saying there's no way. Change of pace that time out of way. And you see Pena with that big swing. They've got the ninth K ready. But instead it's lifted into shallow right. Justice comes in near the line. Two out in the eighth. Well, there's a Saturday Night Live alum. Great comic actor Bill Murray alongside Ted Turner in the Braves box. And tonight. At 11:30 Eastern, or a half hour after we leave the air, whichever the case may be, another edition of Saturday Night Live with host Gabriel Byrne. Ruben Amaro Jr., son of the former Phillies and Yankees shortstop, switch hitter, former Philly himself. Ball one. See Lopez trying to coax that ball <laughs> towards the outside corner. Well, watching this guy catch an O'Brien too. I mean, they set up so nice, easy target. They never move once they put the target up, and especially with Glavin tonight. McGriff. Glavin covers a one hitter through eight. And inning away from the end of a five year quest for the Atlanta Braves. The countdown is started at Fulton County Stadium, but they'll have to face the top of the order in the top of the ninth, and that means Lofton to start it. And if he gets on, they don't necessarily have to hit Glavin hard to tie this game. And somewhere Yogi Berra is saying, it's never over till it's over. Now, you know, we were talking earlier show about the guys who are not nervous in this game. I mean, here's Glavin. Looks like he's pretty well relaxed. One nothing lead. There are your two heroes yep. right there. If it ends this way, Justice and Glavin. The low hit game of Glavin's career, by the way, is a two hitter. Tavares has come out of the bullpen. The rookie right hander who has really been a workhorse for Mike Hargrove. The fifth pitcher is used tonight in a one nothing game. He won 10 out of the pen in the regular season most relief victories in the majors. Lopez to face him in the bottom of the eighth.
You know, Bob, we've talked so much about Glavin tonight. What a great job he's done, and he really has done a great job. But I think you got to you got to give a lot of credit to this Indian staff too. I mean, they've given up the one run, and that was the home run by Justice. And take nothing away from this Indian club fans. Everybody talks about their hitting. They've got an outstanding pitching staff too. A ball and a strike. Martinez started. Left in the fifth. Not the pitcher of record. Glavin is the third hitter in this inning. He's thrown 109 pitches. Wollers is warming up. Even with a one hitter. Do you say, well, Wollers is the guy who's closed out our big victories? We'll go to him again? Well, I think that's what Bobby Cox has done all year long, and I think that's the way Hargrove is, has worked with Jose Mesa. That's your guy. And, uh, you know, it was maybe a 2 nothing, 3 nothing. That's a little different. When you, Bobby Cox, and you haven't won a world championship, you've lost in seven games, you've lost before, you get in a situation where you can win, you want a fresh, hard throwing pitcher out there. He has the luxury of now that he's never had before. And that luxury is having someone like Wallers in the bullpen. In the past, he has never been able to close out the ninth inning because he never had a closer. Now they have a closer. So <laughs> I'm in his corner. I think you need to use him. That's what you got him for. That's what you have your closers for in this situation. One two pitch. And he fouls it again. Now it's, it's been such a great game and I mean you can't ask for any more out of Glavin than what he's given you here tonight. And as you said Joe he told us before the game he said Walters is ready. When you asked him is he tight is he hurting he said no he's ready to pitch right. Lopez 0 for 2 on the walk tonight. Pena for a look. Back in the seats. It would be very easy to second guess Bobby Cox if Wolers comes in and does not hold it. But I know Bobby Cox feels like if he would have had a closer in his previous two world championships in the World Series, he may have won one of those two. So he'd really feel badly if he did not use Wolers in this situation. Remember, he had to use Charlie Lee Brand, exactly. a starter in relief. Kirby Puckett homered off him in game six in 91. Winfield doubled home the game winner here in 92 off Lee Brandt. Alejandro Pena was good, but not quite great for him. He tried other guys. Now he has Wolders. If this score holds up, it'll be five of six games in this World Series decided by a run. Another one in the seats as Lopez battles Tavares. Now with the exception as you said Bob of game four the Braves won by a score of five to two. I mean this has been a great World Series. It really has. I've enjoyed every game and and the excitement and, and everything that goes with it. Still not much if anything wrong with the game. Nope. Business the game. of baseball the business of baseball that's a different thing. You're right. Terrific at bat for Lopez. Well, I like this kid. I, you know, the more you see him right. and, and watch him swing, Joe, and, and the way he stands in there and the way he's receiving the ball and, and in talking with the coaching staff about him, they say this kid's going to be a good one. He is now getting better. It runs out full. Tough pitch coming for Tavares. He doesn't want to walk him because then you let Belliard sacrifice and you make it more meaningful should they bat for Gladman. On the other hand, you make it too fat, and Lopez has already shown what he can do in this World Series. Well, you got to take that chance. You got to come right after him. In the air to left. Bell goes back. Bell to the track. Almost at the fence <laughs> to squeeze it. Well, he didn't challenge him. He threw him a breaking ball, and Lopez almost got it out of here. Let's take a look at this pitch. This is a breaking ball. You see it break right there. He went down and got it, and he thought he got it. He throws his hands up like, I've got it. I got another one right there. Whoa. Hold it, Hobby. <laughs> Wait a minute, baby. 
Caramba. Arriba. No ribby. Belliard. I'll tell you what, he had a heck of a cut at a 3 2 breaking ball. Yes, I'll tell did. you that. He almost looked like he was looking breaking ball. He had a heck of a cut. Heavy air, he just said. <laughs> the 0 1 to Rafi. Even though Blauser had an off year, he presents something of a threat at the plate. So they lost a lot of offense at shortstop when he went down, but certainly no defense. No, they gained a little bit defensively because Blauser was hurting. He had the bad knee earlier, and so they really gained something. And anytime you replace your shortstop, you want to replace it with a defensive replacement because that's the job of a shortstop is to play defense. And there you see Blauser in the in the dugout. Luis Polonia has come out of that dugout. He's in the on deck circle, so they will pull Glavin after eight. He gave only one hit to the Indians, a very soft single into right center by Tony Pena. Belliard hits this one right on the nose, and Bell comes in to backhand it just above his shoe tops. Albert Bell with a good night in left field. Well, Belliard finally hits one hard. Actually, he's hit two balls hard tonight, and Bell comes in and makes a fine backhanded catch. He hit a ground ball up the middle sharply that became a double play. Now he hits this one hard, and he just says, I just can't buy a hit in this World Series. Nice play there by Bell. Well, now Ossenmacher. Is going to come in with Polonia being set up as the pinch hitter. And I think Hargrove has Cox exactly where he wants him. He does, I don't think Cox wants to pinch hit here and use up another player because it's still only a one to nothing ball game. Hargrove will use a half dozen pitchers in a one nothing game. And why not? It's game six. Of the World Series. We'll be right back. Paul Ossenmacher, former Atlanta Brave, has been with a number of clubs. The Indian left hander, their sixth pitcher, he's come on now, and he'll face Polonia, who will bat for Glavin. Trying to keep it a tidy one nothing ball game and then in the top of the ninth, it'll be Wohlers out of the bullpen facing Kenny Lofton Omar Vizquel Carlos Baerga and if anybody gets on Albert Bell. Now this is not over by any means. Tom Glavin a beautiful effort tonight. See Wohlers next. The Indians have their shot yet in the ninth. And Polonia stepping in there. And the reason I said he didn't want to use another player is in case the Indians tie this and you go into extra innings, you cannot use up all your players early in the ballgame. That's why Bobby Cox is leaving Polonia in to hit. Thinking about a drag bunt, taking strike one. Polonia with a surprise home run off Hirschheiser in game five at Cleveland, only his fourth homer in the last four seasons, his first as a Brave. Oh and two. Check swing foul. You know I don't think anybody in this ballpark cares about another run here in the city. <laughs> they want the ninth. They want the ninth. Well that guy cares about another one. He'd like to see him get one more. <laughs> He'd feel a little safer. How important was it for Tommy to give them a three run edge speaking of Cleveland right. in the eighth in game five Mesa yielded the two run homer to Klesko sit down Luis. Normally you don't get something like that after a check swing on a curveball. 
I think this is a fastball just got away from Osumaka. I, don't, I, I really don't believe he's trying to move this guy back. The previous pitch was a check swing on a curveball. It's one of those times where Louis glad he's only about 5 9. <laughs> Stands 6 2 and he gets bonked on the Ooh. dome. Well, if he throws him a breaking ball now, we know that's what he meant to do. <laughs> he makes quick work of Luis Polonia. And the stage is set for the ninth. If, underline if, the Braves win it here, it'll be especially sweet for people like Tom Glavin, David Justice, Mark Lemke, Steve Avery, Kent Merker, John Smoltz, Raphael Belliard, Jeff Blauser, Wohlers, the man on the mound now, Bobby Cox, the pitching coach Leo Mazzoni, because they were all here for the near misses in 91 and in 92, and in the LCS against the Phillies in 93. Three outs away from the one thing they haven't achieved in half a decade and a strike to Kenny Lofton. This is the key hitter of the inning because he cannot stop Lofton from stealing a base if he happens to get on. So he needs to get Lofton out. One and one that's not just because of Lofton's speed but because Waller's motion makes him easy to run on even for a lesser base stealer than Lofton. Yeah, he's almost the same as he is out of the windup, Joe. He's got that slow leg kick and delivery from the stretch. The 1-1. One, one. Down and in. Thousands of people here. Trying to record almost any moment in this ninth inning for posterity. We see the flash bulbs popping all around the park as each pitch is delivered from Wallers to Lofton. Just a few now, but as the pitch comes, there will be more. Blooper and foul ground. Belliard racing over. Backhanded grab. That's why the batting average doesn't matter so much. That's why Cox wants him in in the ninth. This, folks, does not presume that it ends here, but it's business that must be taken care of. This 1995 World Series game brought to you by the makers of Advil. Buick and your local dealers. Remember Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. And Network MCI, how to get modern communications technology working for your business. Well, again, for all of those who wondered why he didn't pitch it with him in for him early in the ball game, this is why. He is their defensive specialist. He's the guy that he knows can make the plays under pressure. And that's why Bobby Cox said, I always hate to take Rafael Belliard out of the ballgame for a pinch hitter. And look at those numbers. One error in each of the last three seasons. That tells you how good he is defensively. He booted his first chance in this series. Kenny Lofton leading off game one against Greg Maddox but since then he sparkled Mike Hargrove can't afford to leave his shortstop in he'll send up Sorrento a 25 home run man hopeful that Wallers makes a mistake and Sorrento can tie it Sorrento had a pinch hit double off Wallers in game four. By Erga next. High. You know, in, in watching Waller's year, Joe, to the last couple of hitters, he did it on Lofton. Yes. And he starts Sorrento off with a breaking ball. I, I know this guy's got power, and he, he can probably hit you deep the other way, too, talking about to left. But I mean, with a guy like Waller's, who we've said throws in that triple digit area, I mean, to start a guy out bang, bang with a strike instead of the breaking ball, I'm a little surprised. 
Well, remember in this situation, you should always go with your best pitch. And, and, and his, his best, best pitch, pitch is, is not a fastball. fastball. Somebody's got to reach for Bell to have one more at bat at least in this season. One out, and nobody on, and the 1 0 pitch. And he's got a great splitter, too a fastball, curve, and a splitter, or slider, and a splitter. But but to establish yourself or get ahead on that guy is, is so awfully important. It's only a one nothing game. The one one. Threw him the splitter and gets ahead one and two. That was it. And a good one it was. Bottom fell out of that baby. Here it is one more time. You can see it. Splitter down. Sorrento chases. Center field. Grissom. Lots of room. One out away. The most feared offense in baseball all year long. Held to one hit through eight and two thirds by Glavin and Wolers. Held to a team batting average under 200 now in this World Series. Maybe. Baerga is 0 for 3. Left center field. Grissom on the run. The team of the 90s has its world championship. Look at Nagy still filling out the pitching chart but now there is no tomorrow. Over the full season there's little doubt the Cleveland Indians were the best team in baseball in 1995. But for a week in October, the Edge belonged to the Atlanta Braves. They have been baseball's best team over the last five years. And finally, the one missing piece is in place.
What a golden season it was for the people in that dugout and in the visiting clubhouse tonight in Atlanta. But all the joy for now is on the home side. Still, there's no overlooking what the Cleveland Indians did, not just in terms of performance, but in the spirit of that whole city. They're part of the renaissance of the city of Cleveland with their new ballpark, with their contending team, with the way that town feels about them, and with the pieces in place. Every reason to expect they've got a good chance to be back. But tonight belongs to the Atlanta Braves. Well, it's sad when you look at players on a losing club, it always boils down to one game. I mean, the final game. And on the loser's side, as you look at Tavares, who, who did such a great job for the Indians this year, it's down to this game. Sitting alongside Carlos Baerga, but as Joe well knows, and fans. You can take into consideration what they've done here tonight and how they responded. This this win belongs to the players for the immediate moment, Joe, right. in the clubhouse. That's exactly right. Yes. I think that says it all right yes. there, finally. Finally. And I think that's what the Cleveland Indians, the way they have to look at this. Very rarely does a team go out and win in their first attempt at in the World Series. Let's face it, the Braves, this is their third time in before they've been able to win. And I think the Cleveland Indians, it may take them another time at least before they feel the joy of victory in the World Series. And David Justice, who earlier had chided the fans here for not being enthusiastic and passionate enough, how ironic that he would deliver the home run of the sixth inning, the only run of the game, and now he and his teammates are awash in this celebration which sounds pretty loud to me. They were ready tonight. 52,000 plus in Atlanta and millions more all around the southeast and in fact all around the country because the Braves have many fans in far flung places because they're on a superstation. They like the Cubs have a national following. Well here's the story. We have plenty of time to visit both locker rooms and we'll do that as we return to the 1995 World Series after this from your local stations.